I have been asked by many people, what is the actual situation in the Philippines? I think this Japanese explained the situation in the Philippines very well. As you very well know, the Japanese have a difficulty pronouncing their R's. Manila becomes Manira. And so this Japanese gentleman stood up and said, My dear Filipino people, you are very rocky. And I consider, he said, the Filipino people the most rocky people in Asia. <laughs> and the people were, of course, surprised. They wanted to know why, were, why they were lucky. He said, you know why you are rocky? You have a president who robs you. And you have a first lady who robs you more. They brought me to a mountain hideout in the Sierra Madre and placed me in a box. I had only my brief and my t-shirt. I refused to eat because I thought they were poisoning me. There was nothing in the room, barely nothing. And I had nothing to do but twiddle my thumb. And for the first time in my life, I heard the ticking of every second and I was counting every second into minutes. And as the minutes marched into hours and the hours into days and days into weeks, I knew what loneliness meant. For seven years, I was not allowed to see the moon and the stars. There were days where they left me all alone by myself. I had no reading material. I had nothing. I was twiddling my thumb. I would walk and walk and walk across my room. Just a room of about four meters by five meters. Hoping that I'll get tired. And then when I get tired, I will fall asleep. Knowing that tomorrow will be the same. My friends, I cannot understand the temerity and the gall of these people. Eh, kang ganon, be practical. Eh, talagang ganun eh. Makibagay ka na ikaw. Napakalakas ka ng bagyo eh. Ikaw lahi ka mahihirapan diyan. Mag-isa ka dyan. Hindi bali kang ganun. Kung ayaw mo nang sumulat, eh, tumawag ka na lang sa telepono. Ibulong mo na lamang. Ayos na. I would like to tell you that I was tempted in my 7,000 almost 7,285 days in prison to do just that. I am only human. Ako po isang tao lamang. When my wife and children would visit me and they would leave me at task after one hour, I also would like to enjoy the embrace of my children and the peace of my home. But if I gave faith in that conviction, if I refused to accept the jurisdiction of a military court, and because I refuse to defend myself, they will give me the death sentence. I vowed to myself that because you have elected me to the Senate and I gloried in its pomp, therefore it is now time that, that's my, I am, uh, that I must suffer the consequences of my act. And because I knew, they were paraded before me. I never saw them in my life. And yet they were pointing fingers at me, accusing me of crimes I never committed. They admitted to crimes. They said they were communists. They said they were number three in the communist hierarchy. And yet the government set them free, and I was in jail. But I knew that somehow I will regain my freedom. Maybe not in this world, but elsewhere. And I knew that sometime, somewhere, Mr. Marcos and I will meet. And in that meeting, I will have my satisfaction. They allowed me to run, and they made a little corral for me. They brought me out between 11 and 12 o'clock. Every day, they brought me out to exercise. On that particular day of March, as I was walking around my little corral, all of a sudden I developed a chest pain. And then the pain was so terrible that I sat down and I asked my guard to massage my chest and asked him to bring me back. I called for the army doctors, they checked me and they said, muscle spasm lang po yan, that's nothing, just take a rest. And so I rested. But after 40 days, I was so weak, I could not even take a bath, I was shaking. And I told my doctor, I said, look doctor, I don't know, I said, your diagnosis or its accuracy, but I am very, very weak. Please bring me to the Philippine Heart Center and get me an examination. That doctor, fortunately, on that morning, 
After 40 days, on April 10, 28, his name is Colonel Bayani Garcia, came to my office and said, Yes, Senator, sabi niya, I will now recommend that they bring you to the heart center because apparently you're not getting well. Mr. Marcos has just arrived from Honolulu. I will make my recommendation. And I wrote a letter and I told them, if you do not bring me to the heart center, I will be constrained to appeal to the Supreme Court. And so he said, no, sir. Ako na pong bahala, I will talk to the commanding general. At one o'clock that day, a knock on my door came and I was given a letter from the commanding general. I thought it was the approval of my request. When I opened the letter, it was handwritten note and it said, My dear Senator Aquino, it is with deep regret that I inform you, your doctor, Colonel Bayani S. Garcia, died of a massive heart attack an hour ago. <laughs> if you were in my place, here is your doctor telling you that it's a muscle spasm, tapos bigla siyang namatay. How would you feel? <laughs> Finally, on May 5, 1980, almost midnight, they took me from my cell and they brought me to the heart center. That was a Monday. The doctors at the heart center met me, took preliminary tests, and they told me, Senator, they said, tomorrow we will begin the battery of tests. And so I slept, but I could not sleep. That was the first time I was brought out of my cell in almost seven years and seven months. And there were beautiful nurses, and the first time I was seeing women in seven years and seven months. And naturally, I was watching my heart as it was palpitating. <laughs> but as I sat down after that x-ray, I was just about to sip my coffee. All of a sudden, I, get, I got hit again by a terrible chest pain that was almost choking me and my arm was getting paralyzed. So I told the nurse, I said, Miss, please bring me to bed. So they brought me to bed and they put all of those gadgets. And all of a sudden, the needles were squiggling. And they called the doctor. The doctor looked at the tracings. And then after one hour, they came back to me and said, Mr. Senator, we are canceling all, all tests. I said, why? Because we already know what's wrong with you. I said, what's wrong with me? You have black art arteries and you must undergo an emergency triple bypass. Otherwise, you may die in six days to six months. I told them, where can I have my operation? Dito lang po, sa heart center. And that's the heart center of Imelda Marcos. <laughs> and I asked, who can do the operation for me? The director said, ako lang po. There are two other assistants if you want, but I'm the only one performing in the center. He was director, he was the director of the heart center. Handpicked also by Imelda. I said, doctor, pagpaliban muna ka ako. Thank you na lang. <laughs> I said, if they cannot operate on me in America, please bring me to my cell. The truth is, I did not want them to touch me in Manila. And so there was a crisis. The sec Deputy Minister of Defense came to my room. He tried to talk me out of my decision. I said, no. And so finally he said, are you willing to write a letter to Marcos requesting to be brought to America? I said, yes. Eh siguri kang ganun, mas maganda kung mag-iwan ka ng dalawang anak mo, parang maniwala na babalik ka. <laughs> and so I wrote my letter to Mr. Marcos and made two covenants. That if I leave, I shall return. And two, that while in America, I shall not speak out against his regime. And I also said, I will only bring three of my children with me. That's also true. But of course, the other two were already abroad. <laughs> and then, my friends, that was a Wednesday when I wrote that letter. All of a sudden, on Thursday morning, May 8th, my wife visited me early in the morning and she told me, the hospital is crawling with Metrocom cars. Guards all over the place. Bakay kami magbibisita sa'yo. Then all of a sudden, my guards started jumping, putting their barong Tagalog, hiding all of their guns. I said, tama, may darating na VIP. And then, lo and behold, the beautiful one ascended into my suite. <laughs> she came, and she was really beautiful. 
She has not aged. There's a plane leaving at 6 o'clock. You can be in that plane. Very simply, Christian socialism means to me an equal opportunity for advancement and the full development of the human being. This means that the poorest person in the land must be given the equal opportunity for education. Number two, the Christian socialist believes that the great legitimizer of government is the ballot, not the bullet. And therefore, because we believe in the ballot, we believe in a majority rule. So that if the majority should opt and should win in a contest, then the minority should accept the majority mandate. But we put a culatilia, that the majority, even if it wins, must respect minority rights. Number three, we do not believe in the exploitation of man by man. Meaning, we do not believe in unbridled capitalism, where the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. In a developed country in America, you may have capitalism. But in a country like the Philippines, with very meager resources and a developing economy, we must harness our meager economy and maximize their benefit. And therefore, there should be centralized economic planning, and the government must actually give the direction as to prevent any overlap. Finally, I do not believe in the monopoly of basic industries. Why should one family monopolize one electric company in the Philippines? Or why should one family monopolize the ownership of one airline company in the Philippines? Or why should one company monopolize the telephone company in the Philippines? Since the government is funding all of this to begin with, these families are borrowing from government institutions and must depend on government guarantees. Then I say, let the government own them and let the people share in the profit. Christian socialism, therefore, is nothing more than democracy. Mr. Marcos is a human being. And Mr. Marcos has a conscience. I may even concede that in his own fashion he thinks he's doing right. It is therefore our duty and our obligation to enlighten him. It is our duty and our obligation to tell Mr. Marcos that maybe he is wrong. But definitely Mr. Marcos is a human being and I have not lost hope that we can still reach him in the recesses of his conscience. I've always said that Mr. Marcos is the original terrorist. He is right now employing state violence. But if we use violence against him, he will only justify the use of more violence against us. And since he's, more, he's a more violent man, he has more forces of repression, we will be the loser. In other words, as Gandhi said, if he uses violence against you, do not give him a reason to justify his violence. Because if you're not violent, then before the bar of public opinion and before God, he's the only sinner. This is struggle can only mean victory for all of us. It will mean victory because we are different from those that we oppose. Those that we oppose are happy with the material wealth. But for how long? I have written Mr. Marcos letters upon letters and I told him, read your history, my friend. I have no hatred for you. I only have pity because if you do not see and you do not remove the calluses from your eyes, if you do not remove your blinders, you will meet the same fate of all the dictators of history. What happened to Mao Tse Tung? His wife is now in jail. What happened to Piron? Isabelita is now in jail. What happened to Franco? He's now forgotten. What happened to the Shah? For all of the things that he did, the monuments to his greatness have already been torn down. There has never been a single dictator in history that has lived forever. And so I tell Mr. Marcos, Mr. Marcos, Study the lessons of history before it is too late. I am going back to the Philippines, and if I have to go back to jail, so be it. While it's true, Mr. Marcos, I said, that after my eight years in prison, I have lost appetite for office. I am no longer seeking the presidency of this land. I'm not seeking anymore any office in this country. But believe me, I said, when I tell you, that while I have vowed never to enter the political arena again, I shall dedicate the last drop of my blood to the restoration of freedom and the dismantlement of your martial law.